you all through the Christmas tree. <clears throat> In front of call to worship this morning, I'm using Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. <clears throat> so I invite you to come, old or young or somewhere in between, come and worship the Lord. Come if you're sorrowful, come if you're rejoicing. Come all who are ready to build and develop. Come all who are searching or needing to let go. Come to share in the silence and in the singing. Come everyone and worship the Lord. And so we pray, faithful God, we thank you for your presence with us. In trouble and in joy, you're always there. Help us to see where you were with us last year and open our eyes to new opportunities in this new year. Faithful God, we thank you. Amen. The lectionary doesn't cover the story of the Magi um, this year, and so I'm sort of focusing on that a little bit at the beginning, which is why I've chosen the first hymn, which is, Oh, how are we faithful? Because, of course, verse 4 says, Lo, star-led chieftains, magi, Christ adoring, offering him incense, gold, and myrrh. So that's why I've gone back to the Christmas mode, and we sing number 212, O come, all ye faithful.
My pew, gold and franken, what's it? Aren't much better. Frankincense, gold, frankincense and myrrh, gifts for a king and a priest, and in preparation for his death, with fresh, oh sorry, with <laughs> fresh patience. <laughs> sorry, how did you ever become a wise man? <laughs> I got you here, didn't I? If we'd listened to you and your navigating by the stars, we would have ended up in the back end of nowhere like East Cows. <laughs> <laughs> it was me who got us to the King's Palace, so who's the wise guy now? But come, my friend, we'll ask it that manger, and don't forget the gifts. Oh, dear. <laughs> And so we follow that with our next hymn or carol, 224. As with gladness men, or women of old, did the guiding star behold, as with joy they hailed its light, leading onward, beaming bright. 224. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. 
a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. The second reading is taken from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. As I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or cry, or pain, for the older, old order of things have passed away. He, he who has seated on the throne said, I am, make, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the springs of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. I've got another sort of an apology. I've always told people when I've done Bible studies and things that if you're not sure how to pronounce a word, you just say it strongly and with authority. And everybody else in the group will think, oh, is that the way you say it? But I struggle with two words, and I'm going to say them this morning. So when I struggle, just think, oh, I don't need you saying that right. Ecclesiastes is a word I can't say very well. And the other one, and I've got it written down in bits here, is... What is it? Okay. Apolocalypto. Now, I've said it wrong, I know, but when I say it, you know, it means the end times. Is that all right? There's some words I really struggle with, and I've got both of them this morning. But the book of Ecclesiastes is from a group of Old Testament books known as wisdom literature. We're unsure of when that was written, probably somewhere between 450 and 200 BC. The book takes its name from the word for a person speaking for, before an assembly. It's a teaching text designed to provoke discussion a kind of fictionalised autobiography common in the ancient literature of the Middle East. The book as a whole certainly confronts us with the challenges life brings and the difficulty of holding on to the meaning of life when we each only have a brief span that leads to death. This particular passage puts before us a number of contrasting courses of action and implies that wisdom lies in knowing the appropriate action to take at a particular time. The text doesn't give us guidance on how we should learn to do this, but it provokes us through listing actions that might be seen as very negative, to uproot, to scatter stones, to hate, etc., and giving them a place alongside positive actions, such as healing and building up. 
Often choices like this seem to limit the way we see things. But the author's intention here seems to be to broaden our vision, to help us see more of the tasks wisdom might require of us under heaven. The vision of a new heaven and a new earth in the reading from Revelation stands in contrast with the reading from Ecclesiastes. There, the moments of grief, dying, even hatred and warfare have to be negotiated under the heavens. Here, things have completely changed and there is no more death, mourning, crying or pain. It's a vision that has given strength to countless people down the centuries, especially to those who have found themselves persecuted or powerless. Apocalyptal literature gives us a glimpse behind the curtain of time to the realities of eternity, revealing the purposes of God behind the confusing circumstances of this present life. While these visions can be a real source of comfort, helping people to renew their courage, they can also lead the unweary into an inflated sense of their present role in the coming kingdom. These are perennial problems not limited to the first centuries of Christianity or some dark point in the Middle Ages, but lived out amongst us even during the 2020s. A mature faith somehow works in a fruitful way with the tension between the ultimate vision and the claims of the present moment. We're going to sing again now. It's number 503. <coughs> Many of you may have had this at your wedding. It's number 503. Love divine, all loves excelling.
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are the words of our Lord. In this reading from Matthew 25, we hear Jesus give a description of what the final judgment will be like. In the previous chapter, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives when his disciples came to him and asked him what will be the sign of his coming and of the end of the age. And he had told them to watch out that no one deceived them, claiming to be the Christ. He told them that they would hear of wars and rumours of wars, and that they were not to be alarmed as these things had to happen. He told them that they would be persecuted and put to death. He said that those who stood firm to the end would be saved. He said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end would come. Jesus told them that immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then he says, At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great trumpet call. <clears throat> I often wondered how everybody would see the Son of Man coming, but in this time of technology, it is quite easy to understand now how people all over the world would see this, uh, whether it be on TikTok or whatever that's called and all the other sort of um, social media. But anyhow, this is the background of this reading. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory and all the nations will be gathered and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And I don't know about you, but every time I hear or read this reading, I wonder, will I be standing on the king's right or on his left? And as I've prepared for this address this morning, excuse me, <clears throat> I've heard myself sort of 
thinking out loud, I don't want to be a goat, I want to be a sheep. But you may ask, why am I worried? Because I'm a Christian and therefore I'm a sheep, not a goat. Well, I am worried. And I'll tell you why. I don't think this passage of scripture has anything to do with us being a Christian or not. Well, perhaps it does, but it's more about the depth of our Christianity. Is our faith only surface deep? Do we say the right things, turn up at the right time to the right events, close our eyes when we pray, and are we occasionally heard to utter the hallelujah? But are we just pretending? Or have we been moved so deeply by God's love and mercy shown to us by the death of his only son on that cross that we literally live and breathe Jesus? Are we pretending or are we a real, true follower? You see, it's the true followers that are the sheep. And I think the pretenders are the goats just as much as all those who have never ever accepted Jesus as their saviour are goats. So on what basis will Christ separate the sheep from the goats? For what reason? Will some be called to his right hand and others to be called to his left? And the answer is this. Those who during their life on earth performed acts of love to Jesus will be placed on his right hand. They will be counted righteous. But the righteous at first won't understand. They don't remember that they did anything for Jesus himself. They don't consider their simple acts of love to be worthy of special credit. They don't consider themselves worthy of honour. They're humble. And then Jesus will say, what you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. All those acts of love and mercy you showed to others, you showed to me. Jesus is a loving shepherd. He came to earth to seek the lost. He loves all men. He loves them like brothers. <clears throat> He can put himself in man's place. He feels our infirmities. That's why when we show love to another person, it's as though we're showing love to Christ. Christ is not here on earth in the flesh, but we have the chance to serve him by serving others. It's important to remember one thing here. It's not because the righteous have performed acts of love that they are saved. They are saved only through faith. But these acts of love are signs of their true faith. When Christ sees us perform these acts of love, he knows our faith is true. First comes faith, second comes the fruit of faith, which is works of love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Then the king will send those on his left hand to eternal punishment, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Oh God, please don't let me be a goat. Those on his left hand are the ones who didn't perform acts of love to Christ. Either they didn't accept him at all, or they thought they were serving Christ. Perhaps they went to church. Perhaps they made tithes. They took pride in their religious works. But they did these works only to win praise for themselves. They didn't truly love their neighbour. They didn't realise that when they refused to help their neighbour in need, they were also in fact refusing to help Christ. In 1 John 4, verse 20, we read, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who doesn't love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God. Whom he has not seen. The last judgment is final. There's no appeal. God judges fairly, but his judgment remains forever. Let's think for a moment about that judgment. On that day, will God say to us, Come, sure, take your inheritance? Or will he say, Depart from me into eternal fire? Oh God, don't let me be a goat. I want to be a sheep. There's another thing to think about also. What kind of sins did those on the king's left hand receive eternal punishment for? Murder, adultery, theft, big sins.
sins? No. Their sin was neglecting to do good. Many people wouldn't call that a sin at all. Many people suppose that sin means only doing something bad. But Jesus teaches us here that sin is also omitting to do something good when we have the opportunity. And you'll know that such sins are called sins of omission. These are things that we ought to have done, but didn't. I wonder how many opportunities we've missed this past year, this past month, this past week. How many will we miss this very day? How many times could we affect someone, <coughs> clothed someone, visited someone, cared for someone, picked up the phone and called someone, or in a letter or a card to someone, but didn't? Some of you may know that Oscar Wilde wrote a beautiful story called The Happy Prince. During his life on earth, the prince lived a very sheltered life, and when he died, the people erected a statue of him in the main square of the capital city. <clears throat> the statue was covered all over with leaves of gold. It had two sapphires for eyes and a large red ruby in the handle of the sword. One cold evening, a little swallow on its way south landed at the base of the statue. As he was resting there, a few drops of water fell on him. He looked up and saw that the happy prince was crying. Why are you crying? the swallow asked. When I was alive, I saw no suffering, said the prince. From, but from my perch up here, I can see there is a lot of unhappiness in the world. I'd like to help, but I can't. My feet are fastened to the pedestal. I need a messenger. Will you be my messenger? But I have got to go to Egypt, said the swallow. Please stay the night with me. Okay, but what can I do? In a room, there's a mother tending a sick child. She's no money to pay for a doctor. Take the ruby from my sword and give it to her. The swallow removed the ruby with his beak and bore it away to the woman, and she rejoiced. The doctor came and her child recovered. The swallow came back and slept soundly. Next day, the prince asked him to stay another night. Then he asked him to take out one of the sapphires and give it to the little match girl down in the square. She'd sold no matches that day and she was afraid that she would be beaten when she got home. Once again, the swallow did as he was asked. As he was running these errands of mercy, the swallow's own eyes were opened. He saw how much poverty and suffering there was in the city. Then he was glad to stay with the prince and be his messenger. One by one, at the prince's urging, he stripped off all the leaves of gold and gave them away to the poor and the needy. Finally, he arrived back one evening, but by now the statue was bare, having been stripped of all its ornaments. The night was very cold. And next morning, the little swallow was found dead at the base of the statue. The prince had given away all his riches, but he couldn't have done it without his faithful messenger, the little swallow. Christ our King gave himself totally when he was on earth. Even as he died, he was still giving to those who were receptive. And from his lofty perch in heaven, he surveys the plight of God's children here on earth. But his feet are fastened, his hands are tied, and his tongue is silent. He needs messengers. He needs us. He has no hands but ours, no feet but ours, no tongue but ours. And it's his riches, not our own, that we are called on to dispense. His love, his forgiveness, his mercy, his good news. What's involved in is helping is simple things, things which are available to everyone, giving a hungry person something to eat or a thirsty person something to drink or someone a warm place to meet, welcoming a stranger or visiting someone who is sick or phoning them. To do such things, <coughs> we don't have to be either wealthy or talented. All we need is a warm and willing heart. Everyone can do something, yet even a little swallow. 
There's so much need and suffering in our world that it's easy to feel overwhelmed and guilty. Guilt can paralyze us into doing nothing until we say with the goats, oh God, I don't want to be a goat, I want to be a sheep. Until we say with the goats, but Lord, if we realized it was you, we would have done something. But the good news of the parable is that every good act we do, however small it may seem, is significant in the eyes of God, as precious as if it was done for Christ himself. In the message translation of the final verses of the Matthew reading, it says, he will answer them, I'm telling the solemn truth, Whenever you fail to do one of these things to someone who was being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it for me. Oh God, I don't want to be a goat. I want to be a sheep. But it's no good me shouting at God about this. It's all down to me. It's how I respond to God's extravagant love to me that will make a difference to whether I'm a goat or a sheep. It's not a question about how much to give. I give to children in need, or to Christian aid, or how much I put in the collection bag Sunday by Sunday. It's about how much of myself I'm willing to give, how much of my energy, of my love in service of King Jesus. Rewards in the kingdom of heaven are given to those who serve without thought of reward. For God gives out grace, not out of debt. Let us pray. We know only too well, Lord God, that there are people we have not helped, hungry, homeless, sick, in prison. We know only too well our helplessness in the face of so much suffering in the world. Forgive us if we've allowed our sense of guilt to prevent us doing what we could. Forgive us if we have failed to see you in the faces of those in need and thought that some were not worthy of our attention and help. Forgive us if we fail to recognise our complexity in the circumstances that hurt and damage others. As we are loved and cared for by you, help us to love and care for one another, to take delight in the responsibility you share with us, and to find joy in every act of service as we find ourselves ministering to Christ himself. Amen. And we turn now to number 256, surprise, surprise, when I needed a neighbour, were you there? 256.
respond with the words, this is our prayer. This new year, this is our prayer. Let's pray. Eternal God, whose birth in human form we have celebrated and welcomed, we gather our thoughts and prayers for those in need at the dawning of this new year. As the old year passes, we embrace the new. This new year, this is our prayer. We pray for peacekeepers around the world, who strive to bring order out of chaos, who strive to turn spears into plowshares, who strive to bring civility to cruelty and abuse. This new year, this is our prayer. We pray for those areas of the world in crisis, either natural or man-made, as this new year unfolds. Ukraine, Afghanistan, United States and Canada, Somali, Ethiopia, Congo, Haiti, South Sudan, Syria, and the Holy Land. May this year be the time for conflicts to be resolved, care shown, and equality sought for. This new year, <coughs> we pray this day for those who spent a lonely Christmas and who will spend an equally lonely new year. May those who turn to you in prayer find comfort and peace. <coughs> we pray for those with no family to turn to, no friends to support them, no neighbours who care. May they find inner strength for the day ahead and companionship in knowing you. We pray that churches and other community groups will continue or start initiatives to support these people. This new year, this is our prayer. We pray for those whose finances have been stretched beyond bearing by Christmas and now face a bleak new year of struggle, deprivation and debt. We pray for those whose larders are as empty as their purses, whose hunger makes them as cold as their homes. This new year, this is our prayer. We pray for those who have no homes to heat and who feel helpless and hopeless and rootless. We pray for those whose Christmas and New Year celebrations have been to excess, and yet it brings them no peace, no love, no joy, no purpose, and gives them no meaning to life. This new year, this is our prayer. We pray for those who feel stranded in a foreign land, a long way from home, uncertain of when and if they may return to their homes. This new year, this is our prayer. We pray for those whose homes feel empty or changed as a result of the death of a loved one. Those surrounded by the grief of loss through illness or violence. Recently, we learned of the two disasters on Jersey. The four boys dying after falling through the ice. The young woman shot by mistake in Wallasey. The young man stabbed on the dance floor. The four-year-old who drowned at Centre Parks on Christmas Eve. And so many, many tragedies across your world. For all those individuals and families whose Christmas celebrations and New Year reveling is indelibly scarred by the death of others, this New Year, this is our prayer. We pray for those whose illness weighs them down in these long dark days of winter, those who face yet another year of pain, discomfort and uncertainty because of the waiting lists and NHS crises. This new year, this is our prayer. We pray 
for workers who feel compelled to strike to get a better standard of living, to keep their heads above water, for all those negotiating pay and conditions, and all those refusing to change their stance. Give us all compassion and care that trenches are not dug and disruptions prolonged. This new year, this is our prayer. There is a time and there is a season. For us now, may this be the time to reach out in thought and word and deed to those for whom we have prayed this morning. This new year, this is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. We close this morning with my favouritest carol, brightest and best of the sons of the morning, number 227, 227.
Amen. And we bless each other as we share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God.